Uh, hello again, I'm Xander. Uh, I've been uh, working in community organizing here in Indianapolis for, for several years. Uh, started with labor and uh, then was doing cultural programming and, and movie screens, screenings for uh, a local community center. Um, and kind of through the process of work, we, we realized that, you know, you know, we kept having these like really great discussions after the movies and everybody's like, wow, I got so much out of that. Uh, and, but really feeling like we were like spinning our wheels a lot, having to get, get all the posters out. Emily and Helen know they probably put up dozens and dozens of posters. Uh, and so we're like, well, we've got this amazing tool, the, uh, maybe you've heard of it, the internet, <laughs> that distributes things quite easily. So we started coming together and, and meeting around how can we um, better the communication systems in, in our city and, and get the word out that needs to happen. Um, and, and we have today uh, the honor of having Tracy Rosenberg has flown all the way in from Oakland. Um, first of all, can we just get a round of applause for, her, for Tracy? <laughs> Executive director for an organization called Media Alliance and has been an advocate and activist uh, in, in media for 17 years now. Yeah. <laughs> for a while, for a while. Um, and so, well, I've, uh, I've been driving crazy around all day meeting up with uh, KI Eco Center and Matt Davis and, and some folks and, and having some kind of strategic meetings about how do we. Uh, Get the get the word out to our people. How do we make our own our own media system that is getting the content and the events and the information uh, for the people by the people amidst all of these corporations that, that control the mainstream media? Uh, and so Tracy can speak about it much more eloquently than myself. Uh, so thank you again for coming, and I'm going to give it up to her in a way. Okay, so apologies for the mic. It always feels kind of weird with a mic and like not so many people because I can totally stand up here and shout, but if they're going to videotape, it's a lot better because otherwise I'll start to trail off in the middle of a sentence and it'll just disappear. So, um, so a little bit about me and my organization. It's 38 years old. Um, I haven't been there for all 38 years. Um, originally started sort of in a whole different universe in 1976 where Woodward and Bernstein had just, you know, toppled the Nixon administration. And journalists were sort of seeing themselves as people who spoke truth to power and knocked down governments and wiped out vice and crime everywhere. Um, we don't really think that anymore about journalists and newspapers and the Washington Post, and we're right. Um, but it sort of came out of that culture with the idea that there were links between journalists and the work that they did and social justice in the country. And still, after all of these years, our organization tries to make that link and, and, and make that connection. Um, and we do that in a number of ways. One of them is talking about sort of media policy, which is basically the framework that we communicate by and who makes those laws, and who sets those rules, and who do they serve, and where's the public interest in this whole equation, because often it's kind of the last thing that anybody thinks about. The second thing that we try to do is create, sustain, help, generate alternative media, which is basically just places that are set aside in whatever the dominant paradigm is, kind of over there, where people's voices can be heard without gatekeeping, without censorship, without corporate interference, without government interference. That, as you may note, as Ed Snowden told us last year, is getting harder and harder and harder because where that space is, is becoming a really huge question. But within that, we have to kind of try to find and carve and create those spaces and keep them as safe as possible. So when we talk about media, there's always a question of sort of, you know, what are we talking about? And back around, oh, I don't know, 1780, what we were talking about was essentially the pamphlet. What we were talking about was you know, the early version of the newspapers, which was basically someone's rant printed on a piece of paper and handed out all over town to whoever could read. And the reality is not everybody could read. And the reality was not everybody could participate. 
and that we're essentially talking about the landowning gentry talking to each other. And we look at our uh, elections now and the voting rights type scenarios, and things are not so different. But essentially, that was a version of media. And we've gone through that through a whole bunch of iterations. We've gone from that to the telegraph. We've gone to the telegraph. We've gone to radio. We've gone to television. We've gone to cable. And we've gone to the internet. And this whole trajectory from basically platform to platform is all about a momentary interval when a citizen at large, however you want to define that, could mass communicate to talk to people that they don't know and aren't seeing face to face and express their point one way or the other on a platform of, of some kind and then slowly over time those platforms become privatized and all of a sudden an average citizen can't really use them anymore. I mean how many of you have been on television? Honestly, okay, how many of you have been on television more than once? Okay, how many of you would say you can get on television pretty much whenever you want to? Okay. <laughs> or not the average citizen in that way. And as time goes by, that will be less and less the case. Um, you know, the trajectory of sort of privatization of media is pretty huge. There was a time when radio was a revolution. There was a time when television was a genuinely subversive force. It's hard for us to go back to those times. The only parallel that we really have in our minds is, is the internet today. And the internet has been that kind of subversive force. It has gotten information through the gatekeepers out to the other side and raising to the surface without anyone in power, what's the word, authorizing that information, without anyone in power dispensing that information. That has all kinds of impacts on a society, some of them very good, some of them extremely frightening to the powers that be. So you may have seen a headline on Monday, something about President Obama saying something about net neutrality and the internet. Well, the reason they said that is because there's an attempt to make the internet stop functioning that way. Very, you know, it's a very clear attempt to privatize the internet. And what that would mean is the playing field isn't equal. And there are decisions being made by the powers that be about what kind of information rises to the top and is easily seen, and what kind of information doesn't rise to the top and isn't easily seen. And that decision would largely be made on the basis of money. Money being an indicator of power and clout in the society. So when we talk about sort of what can we do to increase communications you know, here in Indianapolis and how do we sort of um, fend off, you know, corporate-owned media, which I don't think I have to tell anyone in this room lies to us all the time. I mean, does anyone want to argue with the statement about corporate media lies to us all the time? Because we can do that, but I don't want to waste time on it if it's not necessary. Okay, no votes for the corporate media tells us the truth. <laughs> That settles up. Okay. But the upshot is, you know, we have to do things actively in order to keep the current platform, which is the internet, functioning as a democratic people's media. If we leave it to its own devices, it will follow the road of the newspaper. It will follow the road of radio and of television. And, and of cable and essentially become inaccessible and corporately owned. And it probably won't take very long. So when you talk about a, um, a co-op, the question becomes sort of, what are you really talking about? Because a co-op is a non-hierarchical way to own things. It's essentially a, a mass media ownership of, of of mass media. And co-ops are hard for us because we don't do things cooperatively in this society. We do things hierarchically in this society. We try to set up who's in charge. And if we don't know who's in charge, confusion tends to, tends to break out rapidly. 
So the very action of saying this is not in the control and command of that individual over there tends to make it very hard for an organization to function. And we have a joke, we call it the nonprofit industrial complex, and it's basically the ways in which not-for-profits tend to form kind of like big corporations, except they don't make any money. Because it's just kind of what our natural thing is. We want to put things in order and make an organization chart, and that all makes sense. And then we understand who bosses who around, and we can solve all the problems that way. Um, what we generally end up with, though, is we end up aping the system, and it doesn't really work that different. So when you talk about sort of a, a, a cooperative effort to sort of do media, you're basically talking about let's take this mass media platform, which is under threat, and let's do two things. Let's try to make it work democratically. In other words, let's try to make the content that comes out reflect the whole society. But we're also talking about, and let's do that work in a, in a subversive way. Let's do that work in a non-corporate structure. Let's do that work in a non-hierarchical structure because we think that the way in which we do the work will impact the way that the work comes out on the other end. That there's a relationship between how we live and what we produce and what people get on, it on the other side. And that's probably true. The only thing is that we have to learn how to do work cooperatively. So part of what we're going to talk about is a couple of media collective efforts that have happened in the past and what happened to them and how they worked. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on here in Indianapolis, and that's the part that you guys are going to have to do because I don't know what the heck is going on in Indianapolis at, at, at all. I just got here at 11 p.m. last night. Um, so that's the part that you're going to do. And hopefully we're going to kind of come out of here with some idea of how a journalism co-op or a media co-op could really make things better here, potentially. So that's kind of the goal, and we'll do some breakout stuff and have some small conversations. But just to kind of see those conversations, um, I'm going to throw out a couple of examples, and it may be stuff that you guys know all about and have heard about, and you may have other examples from your own experience here or in other parts of the country, and if you have them, you should tell me what they are. But I'm just going to throw out a couple. And I'm going to focus on, sort of on the world of media and journalism, because that's my world and that's what we're talking about. But I think for everyone, any sort of cooperative experience that you've had really kind of factors in here. And you probably have a list, and we'll probably talk for an A-list, of things that can and have gone wrong with the food co-op or the living co-op or the um, the workers' collective, or whatever it may be. And you know, all of those things come into play, because it's not really that different from sector to sector. But, um, but we'll start off sort of in media land and kind of work our way over. So, I wonder if we should start with other parts of the world here. Let's start here, and then we'll sort of journey out to other parts uh, of the world. Um, so let me start here. Um, if I said World Bank IMF, what would you say? <laughs> okay. Uh, some of you would probably say Seattle 1999, or would you not say that? Okay. Do I need to explain what happened in Seattle 1999? Yeah. To anybody? I do. Okay. All right. So the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are international organizations largely dominated by the United States to carry forward a kind of neoliberal financial reform. They focus their attentions largely on developing countries, and they try to help them straighten out their troubled economies by essentially enforcing a series of structural reforms, most of which prevent the governments of these countries from investing in the education and the training and the workforce development and the community health services of their own people, because they're so busy paying off debts and cutting every social service on earth to demonstrate to the World Bank and the IMF that they are financially responsible and will not default on their ever increasing loans. So essentially it's kind of a catch-22 cycle that says you're poor, you need our help, we will help you and you will trash your own country in the process of getting this help from us. 
Um, so the World Bank and the IMF have been doing this for a number of years. And eventually, although they're kind of shadowy organizations, they're not really public facing, mm -hmm. a number of international activists started to look and see and point, you know, that organization, the World Bank, the IMF, those are the ones that are causing um, resource stripping and essentially societal breakdown in much of the developing world. That's who's doing it. They're giving out these crazy loans and demanding these insane structural reforms in return that essentially prevent these companies, these countries from investing in their own people. And if that kind of investment isn't done, it's kind of hard to get off of the treadmill. And the treadmill is essentially not being able to use your own resources for the betterment of your own country. Um, so they decided to start protesting the IMF and the World Bank and followed it around essentially in various places that it meets, having large street demonstrations, which was a very bizarre thing for the IMF and the World Bank. They weren't used to this, so they brought out some pretty heavy artillery. Um, you know, the Ferguson of the tank, the 1999 version of the tanks and the tear gas and the heavy duty police response, because there were a lot of dignitaries there and they didn't want them to get protested. Um, <laughs> so, in, so in response, a bunch of journalists got together, basically said, look, we have a problem here. Basically, activists are doing something important. They're getting attacked, and nobody's telling the story. Um, you know, we basically have people being ripped apart on public streets all over the world, and we can't get this honestly reported. We're going to have to do it ourselves. We can't do it any other way. They won't tell the story. Um, because they had massive protests, and you know how it is, you get 20,000 people to a protest, and you pick up the news or the paper, and there were, and there were 3,000 people. And you say, what? <laughs> Where were they? What protest did they go to? It's not just an argument about, you know, half the size, it's one-fifth the size. What are they doing? And, you know, no one's up honest. Mistake. Of course it's not an honest. It's, of course it's not an honest mistake. It's a narrative that protest is not effective. You know, it's a narrative that things are not as big as they are, not as successful as they are, that discontent in the country is not as prevalent as discontent in the country actually appears to be. And if you say this narrative often enough, the vast majority of people who don't go to demonstrations on a regular basis will believe. Okay, so 1999, Seattle, big protest planned because the IMF and the World Bank were coming to have this meeting in Seattle, which is usually a fairly sleepy city, not used to massive protests. And this one went massive. There were hundreds of thousands of people. They called the Teamsters and Turtles because the environmentalists and the labor groups both came and, and didn't fight for one of the few times that environmentalists and labor could kind of get along at the same protest. It doesn't happen too often. It's a once in a decade experience. It was one of the great moments for the left, because the Teamsters and the Turtles were okay. And, um, and the demonstrations were massive and somewhat violent. And a bunch of independent journalists dropped down and they just rented a store, a storefront. And in that storefront, they set up a media center and they called it the Independent Media Center. And its job was essentially to report on what was happening on the protest every minute of, of every day and to make that information available. So all the people in town who were protesting had somewhere to go to get information about what was going on, as in large battalion, co, co riot cops on 10th and King. You need to know. Don't walk into those kinds of practical, logistical things. And don't forget, this was 1999, so we weren't all walking around with smartphones on our heads, you know. Um, and also so that there would be legitimate recounting of everything that happened on the web, easily, right there, so that reality couldn't shift, so that reality wasn't determinable by CBS, ABC, NBC, the Seattle Times Inquirer, whatever. In other words, reality existed and was documented by the people who were protesting and was right there for everybody to see. So the newspapers could misreport it if they wanted to, but there would be a countervail. And it wouldn't just be people in their own heads saying, damn it, I was there, there were 100,000 people on the streets, I know it, I'm not crazy. There'd be pictures of 100,000 people in the streets, right there, on the web, taken at the time. So the Independent Community Center did, in fact, 
reported what happened in Seattle IMF and for a number of international protests that went on for years after that. And 79 of these centers were set up in the US and foreign countries. The number eventually hit 159. There's currently about 99 left. Uh, there's probably one in Indiana, no? Or was it some point? Does anybody know? Was there ever an Indianapolis Independent Media Center? Because I meant to look it up. Never? Okay. Well, that's too bad. But, <laughs> but there was one in Chicago, and there was one in St. Louis, and there was one in Houston, and there was one in Albuquerque. And they were pretty spread out throughout the country. And what you basically have is an open publishing network. Anybody can publish. And if you go to any independent media center, you will see many stupid things published. You do not want to read that news feed line by line by line because it's open publishing and people can publish any number of stupid things and they do. However, when something is happening, you get on the ground, direct from the source, coverage in real time. And that is not as valuable as it was back in 1999 because now we have Twitter and we didn't really have it. But it was a model for how you can document objective reality without gatekeeping and put it out there and use the internet in, in, in order to make objective reality real. Because otherwise, the media creates what reality is for anyone who's not there right then that second witnessing it. They find out what happened from the media which essentially means they find out what happened from corporations, from corporately owned companies. And for, from a social justice point of view, from a social change point of view, that's inherently problematic. Because really, the interests of Westinghouse is not the same as the interests of social justice and social change activists. And I'm not saying anything about the individual people who work for NBC. They're, they're people, they have jobs, they're, they're, they're doing the best that they can but the interests in play are, are not the same. So if you don't have a way to make reality be real, you're in a very tenuous situation as an activist and an organizer. Because as we've seen, when you're talking about um, politics, they call it spin. And you know what you call spin, it exists outside of politics too. We just know about it in politics because it's so blatant and it's so extraordinary. And reporters get on TV and they call things like the spin cycle because they talk about it openly. Because uh, there will be a debate. Who won the debate? They will literally have a show afterwards called the spin cycle, dedicated to explaining to you how people are, are explaining to you who, who won the debate. Because whoever actually won the debate factually, there is a creation of a perception that is a great battle. And essentially, whoever wins that battle sort of wins the debate, no matter what actually happened. I mean, you've been through political debates where they announced to you that the other guy won. And you're like, I watched that, and the other guy actually didn't win. But if the perception's been created, well, that's, that's, that's what it is. Because essentially, we're in a mass media culture. The country's big. And so in a sense, what they say happened, starts to become what's happened. So you really have to start thinking of alternative and community media as the antidote to that. And the more that becomes widely disseminated and the safer that we can keep it, the more we potentially have a counter narrative to what I would call manufactured reality. And there's a book way back when called Manufacturing Dissent. It's essentially about the fact that, yeah, they can make up reality. They have all the tools. And they do make up reality. And that's why political conversation is so degraded in this country, because in a lot of cases, when you talk to people, the reality they're talking about isn't really reality. You know, it's some kind of manufactured version. And so conversations fall apart, because we're not even starting from the same starting point about what's real. Um, and you can have kind of that climate change discussion. And you spend a lot of time discussing whether climate change is happening. They're not really discussing what we can do about it, which is the real thing we have to talk about, isn't it? You just sort of are having the reality versus lack of reality conversation. And a lot of our conversations go that way. And there's a reason for that, because if 
you're arguing about what's true, then you're not arguing about what to do about it. You know, it stalls social progress. It stalls emotion. It, it makes people feel hopeless because the arguments are so repetitive and so stupid and can't ever be settled because they're not reality-based. So the, the who owns reality is a really, you know, fundamental thing for social change activists. And so when people tell me that media is not their issue, they don't do that. You know, they're more concerned with health care, they're more concerned with job creation. And these are important things. But the point is the reality about what's going on with health care, the reality about what's going on with jobs, is a media creation. And the realities that we're battling and the perceptions about that really impact what we can do about these things in a real sense. So if we sort of throw the other side the business of creating what the reality is, we make our work in any sector that we're organizing in way, 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 way harder. You know, we have to sort of claim back the ability to kind of tell the story and to tell the story realistically about what's really going on. So, okay. So that's why media matters, in short. Because you can't trust the corporate media to tell the story the right way. They're not going to do it because they don't have any incentive to do it. That's not what they want. That doesn't make them any money. Why would they? So if that's who owns the media, they're not going to do it for us. So how do we do it ourselves? I mean, that sounds like an overwhelming task. But the whole scenario for the folks at, say, the Independent Comedia Center, which is now, what, 15 years ago? was, well, we're going to set up a little shop and we're going to tell the story ourselves. And the reality was that so many people ran into that place during the protest saying they'd seen something, something had happened, they wanted to get it out. That it almost kind of told itself just because they set up the space to kind of do it in. And what you often find when you open up spaces in the media, that the stories kind of just well up. They just kind of tell themselves because they haven't really had the ability to do that before. And we see that with social media where they set up a frame, basically. And we've all filled it in with lots of sluts. I mean, there's no lack of content on social media because there's space there to say something. And we're all full of stuff and it's falling out of our ears. We say things 20, 30 times a day. Now, a lot of it's crap. A lot of it's pictures of cats. Too much of it. Um, and I say this guiltily, I put up a picture of my cat yesterday, it's not dissing people, it's just, you know, yes, I use the wonderful world of alternative media to post a picture of my cat growing up on the balcony. And we all do that. But the ability to do that is about more cats. And that's kind of what's important. And if it becomes privatized and just about cats, which is certainly what Facebook wants, I mean, let's face it, they would prefer that we not put up, you know, political action mementos, that we not put up, you know, sad stories of injustice. They would prefer that we post more pictures of cats and play candy crush. We know that because it's much easier to maintain. Um, but the content sort of tells itself. So when we say we could set up a co-op here, those stories will 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 come to inhabit that space and they'll come to tell stories. And being together, they'll build a kind of an alternate reality, which is much realer than the fake stuff that we get. It's much realer than what's on our TV. It's much realer than what's on our radio. And it's much realer than what's on our Facebook feed, let's face it. So, okay. So when you look at other countries, a lot of times what you have to kind of look at is, you know, a differing political reality and a different kind of in, in incentive for doing the work, but essentially the same kind of model. So I'm going to pull out one, which some of you have heard of, probably. The Zapatistas down in southern Mexico? Mm -hmm. OK. For anyone who doesn't know who the Zapatistas are, Sacramento Marcus, OK. OK. All right, OK. So Mexico is kind of a conglomeration of um, three groups, um, indigenous folks who are largely connected with one or another of the indigenous tribes that live there, um, mestizos who are half and half, and people who are largely Spanish identified um, and who largely have been upper class colonial. And so there's all kinds 
of complicated class structures that run through the society about you sort of where you are on, on that totem pole, um, which is very clear to natives and totally obscure to everybody else. We don't even, you know, we don't even take it in, but it's there. And um, you can also see some of it physically. Um, indigenous um, Mexicans are generally shorter and rounder than, uh, than, than other folks. So there's like a class thing. People look different and they sound different and they speak differently if they're on a different you know, social tier within the society. So if you go down to southern Mexico, you will see a, a, a much more, uh, less, what's the word, less integrated indigenous population that's quite strong and whose culture is rather um, potent and in front. And you will also see some of the most severe class distinctions as a result in southern Mexico. So um, a lot of indigenous folks are concerned about land. They like to live on their land and farm it. And of course, the Mexican government wants to develop the area um, and get rid of all this you know, farming indigenous crap. Who makes any money off of that? Because um, values are different. Um, so there's been sort of for many years, a kind of a cold war going on. And um, the Zapatistas were essentially a political formulation, a political party for indigenous, not independence politically, but cultural independence. You know, the ability to live our lives the way that we wanted to live it, essentially on the land that we lived on for X number of years. And without um, militarization, without kind of a, a militarized occupation, by the Mexican government, which essentially would send soldiers in to grab land to build hotels for us. Um, Cancun is the biggest example of you know, the development of land in southern Mexico. And um, the Zapatistas were both a, a military movement and a media movement. And the media movement is the most interesting part that applies to us. And of course, they were co-op values. I mean, they were very much concerned with living in a collective manner and farming the land and keeping um, individualized development out of what was seen in sort of a, a traditional culture. But in addition, basically, there was a heavy militarization in terms of presence that just felt like